Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Bodhi Tree Buddhism for another class. Not sure what number we're up to, maybe 24, 25. And we are, of course, continuing with the Way to Buddhahood, Chang Fu Zi Dao, by Venerable Master In Shun, uh, that very important figure for 20th century Chinese Buddhism, particularly in Taiwan. And uh, this text itself is, is a real classic of, of modern Buddhist teachings. So where were we up to last time? Let me do the old screen share. We were talking about the four truths and we had got up to the section on the second truth. So truths here being the holy truths or more commonly translated as the noble truths. And I think we've talked about that and why I prefer the term holy, even if it's not that common over noble. Um, and remember that, that that term, whether we call it holy or noble, isn't about the truth itself. I mean, like think of the first truth, suffering or dissatisfaction. I mean, what's so noble about dissatisfaction? Nothing. <laughs> it's the worst. It's not the truth that is noble or holy. It is that these are truths for wise people, noble people, or shall we say holy people, people with the insight to see things as they really are. So we were talking about this truth, which we're translating here as the truth of accumulation, or sometimes maybe the truth of the origin, or even the truth of the cause. So it's the cause of that dissatisfaction or that suffering, dukkha, in Chinese, ku. And we've already started looking at this in our last class, uh, where I believe we finished with verse number 71. So let's just quickly redo that. Kuosing uh, you ye ji. The generation of dissatisfaction is due to the accumulation of karma. So in other words, why do we have suffering? Why do we have, you know, dissatisfaction or pain? What is the, the, the base cause of this? It's, it's karma, right? Intentional actions driven by various emotions and, and also ignorance or insight. And the accumulation of karma, in turn, is due to delusion. So that's the real kind of the foundation of all of this delusion, or often translated as ignorance. And so while we have all these actions in the past that we've done, driven by this ignorance or this illusion, um, line three, the activation of karma and its nourishment. So they don't just, you know, the results of, of these actions don't just come about for no reason. They sort of had to be activated at a certain time, and they also have to be kind of continued on at a certain time. So that's the fourth line, when conditions meet or when conditions are met, they bring about the fruition of dissatisfaction. So for example, I'll just make up some entirely fictitious example. So if, for example, you have a friend and every time you go and see your friend, you bring them along a tasty treat, you bring them along a chocolate brownie, or a delicious fresh mango, or just something, something tasty to eat. Okay, so these are intentional actions driven by, uh, it could be by lots of things. It's driven by just general friendship towards your, your, your buddy. Um, this is chance that perhaps at one day, this friend in turn is gonna, you know, start to give you something maybe nice to eat or something in, in return, right? And it's probably gonna come from that same person as well. It's not that you're gonna be doing all this, you know, these nice things to person A, and then the karma is going to come back from some totally other random source. The conditions mean that this action has taken place in a particular relationship between yourself and your other friend. And so also the conditions for the results of that also partly depend upon these factors as well. Right. So kind of the, the, the area or the zone or the conditions about which the action is made are also very closely related to the conditions wherein the result comes about as well. Okay. Of course, here in this example, it's talking about um, the results of dissatisfaction rather than the results of delicious mango pudding. Okay. Anyway, so we covered all that last week. Let us now continue on uh, with verse number 72. And this verse talks about a lot of different ways that we can analyze karma, different categories for it. It can get a bit technical, um, but it's still, I think, really important to have a look at it. So let's read the Chinese first. Ye yo shen yu yi. 三二七不动, 
Karma can be physical, verbal, or mental, wholesome, unwholesome, or immovable. The cessation of karma is like a seed or to fumigate. It is not lost in a hundred thousand eons, but according to the karma, one experiences birth and death, not escaping from the three realms of existence. Okay, so the first line here is one of the simplest ways of categorizing karma. Um, the three gates or the three modes, physical karma, verbal karma, or mental karma. And it's important to note, you know, the word karma is now sort of already in English dictionaries. It's kind of a standard term. And I think I've mentioned earlier that, that actually often it gets used incorrectly. Often people use the term karma to refer to the results, um, things that happen. So, you know, you tease someone and one day you get teased by someone else. And, Aha, that's your karma. Well, it's not your karma. That's the result of your karma. The karma was the teasing in the first place. Okay, so we've talked about that earlier. But another important thing to note is, um, because we often sort of gloss karma and we say it's intentional action. But remember, action, say physical action, yeah, that's action. Verbal action, the things we say, yeah, that's a kind of an action. But mental action, thoughts and emotions, even if they're not expressed externally through our words and our deeds, it's still an action. So that's something that, you know, when we use the English word action, as a way to sort of understand or translate or gloss over the word karma, we probably won't be thinking of the mental side, but it is. In fact, the mental side isn't just a form of karma. It's really the most important form because that is the driving force behind the physical actions or the verbal actions, right? So it's the mental karma, mental action and drive um, is really the most important. And, you know, often um, what can happen is we might have that, some emotion or something going on for a while you might be annoyed about something it might just sit inside you stewing up for a while and it might sort of have to reach a certain level before it, it is enough to make us take some kind of action or do something or say something and of course that's different for everyone some people um you know will always express or always act out on their emotions um some people don't some people keep them like you know I don't want to say bottled up because there's other negative connotations about that, but they might be feeling something, but they don't express it. Um, that might mean they just can deal with it, or it might mean it is bottling up and it's kind of like, and when it does get expressed, it's expressed in a very powerful way. But do recall that karma does include the mental action and all these um, emotions that we're going to be looking at in the next verse, like ignorance, <laughs> craving, desire, anger, etc., are also forms of mental karma. So this is the first way of classifying karma in terms of its, we call it its gate, right? Physical, verbal, or mental. The second line is another way. Um, and this is kind of like a way of classifying karma and sort of like moral qualities, shall we say? Wholesome, unwholesome, or immovable. The first two obviously are a pair, they, they counter each other. Um, wholesome karma. Um, oh, now, just something to note, of course, when we talk about karma as being wholesome or unwholesome or immovable, that is largely dependent upon the mental driving force um, behind it. So for example, when we act with the intention to benefit someone, you go and buy lunch for some homeless person in the street, you help your neighbor feed their cat, and you're not doing it because you want the money, but you just think, yeah, someone should look after their kitty cats. They're going to be lonely while your neighbor's on holiday. There's a wholesome intention. Unwholesome intentions include, you know, actions that are driven by an intention to like harm someone or hurt someone or driven by intentions, say for greed or desire, pride and so on and so forth. So these are, these two are fairly straightforward. Um, wholesome acts, unwholesome acts. The third one though is a little bit kind of tricky and kind of, it's not a common English word, immovable. What does that mean? Um, in this system here, so in this text here, it's given three times. Often what you'll find in other forms of analysis, they'll go wholesome, unwholesome, and then another one called indeterminate. Now, indeterminate can mean it's kind of neither wholesome nor unwholesome. Um, maybe I, you know, I pick up my glass of water and have a drink of water. Is it driven by wholesome motives? Is it driven by evil, unwholesome? Motive? Kind of neither, really. So it's kind of indeterminate. Um, but then we also have this other category called immovable, um, which actually is, is actually, a, in some ways, it's kind of, kind of better than wholesome. Basically, what this refers to is um, when one is meditating. So one, of course, um, 
you know, it takes it takes mental work to meditate. It's not just like this idea of you sit there and don't think of anything. You you have to you have to be able to work your mind, <laughs> possibly your body too, in many ways, in order to deal with the various hindrances to meditation, craving, reversion, get rid of sleepiness, dullness, or mental excitedness. It takes it takes mental work. Um, but this is not really wholesome, shall we say? What it is is it's actually letting go of sensual desires in the sensual world and taking one to a state which goes beyond sensual drivers and sensual forces. Um, and so if we're then working towards, say, entering into these basic levels of dhyana, meditative absorption, then these are classified as immovable karma. So when we think about it like that, the wholesome and the unwholesome really these, these two categories, moral categories, basically pertain to the so-called desire realm, right? Which is the usual realm that humans and animals live in. Um, beyond the desire realm higher, I mean, in meditative states, humans can be on that level. Otherwise, it's sort of a state for what we'd call the gods, the devas. So it's pretty uncommon in a way, <laughs> right? Um, it's, it's, it's not something that you're having to, most of us having to deal with on a day-to-day -day or moment-by-moment -moment basis, but it is important because Buddhists are trying to, you know, you say, well, well, what about meditation? Is that wholesome or un unwholesome? And that's immovable. And of course, the results of, say, meditating up into a higher, higher state of absorption, the results of that also come about in a higher state. So basically the idea that if one can reach the first dhyana of meditation, the, the, Result of that is to be reborn in the so-called, you know, lower levels of the of the heavenly world. Um, so it's important to note that that even these meditative absorptions, these these dhyanas, deeper samadhi, it's not it hasn't escaped karma. It's still in a basic kind of act of karma, and it's still going to have some particular result, even if it's beyond the usual world of of you know the human realm, the usual human realm. Okay, so that's a little bit technical. We're going to talk a little bit later on about different, you know, what is meant by wholesome and unwholesome. The third line, um, the cessation of karma is like a seed or to fumigate. Now, when you read that, that totally needs unpacking. Um, here, the cessation of karma, it's not referring to like how to destroy your karma and, and eliminate all your karma, which is kind of the idea of like liberation, right? You get rid of all the afflictions and all the causes for all the afflictions. Well, that's liberation, right? That's not what's referred to here. What it's referring to is, okay, again, a little bit technical. So Buddhism talks about impermanence, right? Everything's impermanent. And not just impermanent, but things like are changing, bam, 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 moment to moment. Okay, that's just basic Buddhist concept. You know, your body is constantly changing moment by moment, your thoughts, your emotions, et cetera, et cetera. But then, hey, don't Buddhists say that once you enact a karma like it's never lost, right? Which is the fourth line, right? It's not lost in 100,000 eons. So is karma permanent or is karma not permanent? Ah, okay. This is a, this is a really tricky question, actually. <laughs> and Buddhists were faced with this tricky question um, a long time ago and even in the present. So one of the explanations was this. They gave two types of metaphor. The first metaphor is a seed. So think of when you have this intentional action, this karma, is like planting a seed, okay? So you're planting the seed in the soil. Now, technically, the bits that make up that seed, they are, I mean, it's, it's, it's living matter, so it is constantly changing. But while it's a seed, it kind of holds this sort of nascent state, right? It's like it's like dormant. It's not doing anything. Um, of course, okay, now here, here the metaphor falls apart, right? Of course, the seed, at least it's like perfectly preserved, will decay over however length of time. But just bear with me. Okay, it's just a metaphor. Um, and when certain conditions come about, so for most seeds, sort of like moisture and warmth, probably needs a bit of oxygen as well. Um, it doesn't need sunlight. It doesn't need sunlight until it sprouts and has leaves. And when that moisture kind of kicks in and comes in, then um, that seed is going to transform from being a seed. It's going to sprout, and then it's going to become like a little you know, bigger sprout, and it's going to turn into like a little seedling, a little leaves, and, and keep on growing like that. So. While it's a seed, and then while it trans transforms from a seed to a sprout to a seedling, it's constantly changing. And that's what's meant here by the cessation of karma. It's changing moment by moment. Okay, And so 
we can think of that as like a seed is constantly changing, but that seed has always maintained the exact same potential from when it was a seed up until when it grows and becomes a sprout and a seedling, right? So in that regard, it doesn't change, doesn't change its potential, what it can grow into. So it's impermanent, it's changing, but it does preserve that potentiality and that is not lost in 100,000 eons, right? Okay, hope that makes sense. So um, the second metaphor that is used is to fumigate. So this is another idea here, the idea um, that the, the way in which things get, get influenced. So one way of, of, of talking about this is, so for example, um, the ancient Indians used to use sesame oil. So, and you can, you can give flavors and fragrance to that sesame oil. Um, you put all your sesame seeds, a big box or something, you add some fragrances to it and you let it sit there for a long time. And then you take out, so maybe it's like, I don't know, don't know what the ancient Indians use. Imagine a big branch of right, rosemary or lavender, right? A big branch of lavender, oh, very fragrant. You put it in there, leave it there for a long time. You take out the branch, you take out the lavender, but the fragrance remains, right? It like fumigates those seeds. And if you press those sesame seeds into oil, the oil itself will have this like lavender flavor or rosemary flavor. And so likewise, those seeds, I mean, again, it's a seed, a sesame seed, those seeds have been fumigated and permeated by other external forces. They've been changed, um, so they're impermanent, um, but that is lasting. It still continues on from what was your original sesame seed to the seed before you pressed it into oil and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, it's changing, but its potentiality remains the same. Okay, so that's lines three and four, the cessation of karma. So in other words, um, karma is it's changing. It's, it's, it is always changing, even as a potentiality, like a seed or the fumigating of something. Um, and that potentiality is not lost in 100,000 eons. So, you know, the Buddha said, you can't run away from your karma. Um, that, that potentiality for it to bring about a result is always going to be there. Again, as we mentioned in the verse above, it still requires certain conditions um, for that result to come about. Okay, last two lines, according to, should just be according to karma or just according to one's karma, according to karma, one experiences birth and death. In other words, one continues through the cycle of samsara, the cycle of dying in this life, um, that continuity, so the, the mental potentials then take rebirth in some other form. And then due to those mental potentials, those karmas, one has various experiences in the next life, which in turn cause us to have more actions, which create more karma and have more experiences, which then set up this potentiality at the end of that life and so on and so forth. So, you know, again, if we use this, this metaphor of a seed, you can, you can plant some plant, you plant an apple tree, um, you grow the apple tree, the apple tree bears fruit and it's got these seeds and those seeds get, you know, the apple falls off, falls into the ground. Another little apple seedling sprouts up a while later. That grows into another one. Da, 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 da. You know, imagine a field sort of relatively untouched, <laughs> uninterfered with. Um, you know, one apple tree might last for 20, 30, 40 years. It dies, but its seedlings grow up and they grow and then they drop more seeds and then they die you might leave it there for 10,000 years or, you know, a thousand years even, you're still going to have apple trees. They're going to, you know, how much would they be like the original apple tree? It's really kind of hard to say, you know, they could, they could remain pretty similar. Um, depends what they get pollinated with. They could change into some other kind of like cultivar of apples. <laughs> um but you're going to have this kind of like ongoing continuity. It's constantly changing, but there's definitely this kind of line of continuity that threads it through. Um, and the karma would be also depend on what kind of experiences, you know, those apple trees went through. If, if the weather got really, really hard, of course, it would, what we call, evolve into um, a plant that can tolerate the, 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 the cold and the frost. Uh, or vice versa, if it got dry, a certain ones might not survive, but a certain certain seeds that have the DNA to be able to survive in a drought would survive. And so this kind of constantly ongoing process of evolution. Um, but throughout that process, living beings do not escape from the three realms of existence. So as human beings, we're in the desire realm. Um, whether or not we stay in the desire realm 
not a guaranteed thing. Um, if we are able to purify our minds to a certain um, level, you know, certain high level, we can raise it above the desire realm and reach the form realm or even into the formless realm, the, the realm of the, the, the devas. But even the devas themselves don't necessarily stay there for that time. They have their own karma. Um, and when that karma ends, they also might return to the deva realm again, or they might come back to the human realm or something. It's just constant bouncing around. Okay. But it's not random. The most important thing is that constant cycling through rebirth and different forms of existence is not random. It's based on this karma. Of course, karma is being emotional, mental, mentally driven, uh, in turn affected by the environments around us, right? So responses to those. So it's also not just sort of perfectly contained within that living being themselves. Also, we're also responding to our environment. Um, and this is also why environment is so important, right? In our practice, um, if, we were, if we were born in a lower realm, that environment is constantly stimulating very painful experiences, which is unfortunately more likely to make us have really negative responses and generate more negative karma. So you can get on a downward spiral very easily. Of course, flip side is if we're in a good environment, it encourages us to generate wholesome karma. And then we experience that result of that wholesome karma. If we're wise enough to see the real reason for that experience of wholesome karma, that joy, that happiness that comes from Dharma practice, it's also encouraging us to do more wholesome deeds, right? So according to our karma, we experience cyclic existence. And in general, we're not escaping from the three realms of existence. Okay, that's verse 72. There's a lot in verse 72, as you can see. Okay, let us touch very briefly on the three unwholesome roots. So we've talked about wholesome and unwholesome. Let's have a look at the unwholesome. Mental afflictions, desire, aversion, and ignorance are the root of what is unwholesome. Ignorance is like intoxication, confusion. Aversion is severe, desire very deep. So when we talk about afflictions, um, lots of different ways of analyzing the affliction, some of them are very, very fine making little subtle differences, you know, between anger and hatred. Uh, and they all have like technical definitions. But the most critical ones are these three basic ones, right? Desire, aversion, and ignorance. So let's just talk about those for a moment. Um, so often you might see something like greed, so in English translations of these terms, it's common to, have to see these translations like greed, hatred, and, and ignorance. But I really don't think they're very accurate. Greed, um, you know, the way in which we use the word greed nowadays, we often kind of use it to refer to things like, like food in particular, or maybe money. But this is far more subtle than that. It's far, far, far more subtle than that. Um, so desire, I think, is, is a broader term because it covers a whole range of different possible objects. And likewise, um, with the second one, if we translate it as hatred, I mean, hatred's pre a pretty strong emotion, right? And um, I don't know about you, but like, I, I don't think most people experience hatred very often, you know, even the course of a day or two. Hatred is more like anger, like, really like, I hate that. Um, as opposed to just like, oh, I hate it when that happens, like kind of in a flippant way. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when it's really like, it's very powerful, dry. Beside. And again, what we're referring to here is far, far, far more subtle. So I prefer the word aversion. And then I'm contrasting desire and aversion because in many ways, they're very, very similar. What they are is basically responses to the sensations that we experience. So we've talked earlier about the, the, um, the five aggregates. We include the physical sense organs. And we have also talked about how our sense organs, um, shall we say, like, are in contact with the world around us. Like I am seeing, the eyes are seeing, my ears are hearing. I hear a sound, I see an object, and I have a particular sensation from that. Um, it might be a pleasant sensation or a painful sensation or a neither nor neutral sensation. Now, what tends to happen is when we get that pleasant sensation, um, most of the time, now it doesn't have to be, but most of the time, I will experience desire. I want that object, basically. <laughs> and when it's a painful experience, most of the time, again, not necessarily, but most of the time, I have aversion to that. 
you know, um, I'm walking down the street, I'm crossing the road and a motorbike pulls up in front of me and it's just like spewing exhaust gases out and it's, it's gross. And what do I do? I turn my face away and I'm like this. That's a version. <laughs> and that's the kind of thing that we're talking about here. It's not hatred. I don't hate the motorbike. I, don't, I really don't like that smell. But just like that. Um, I'm walking past the shop window. I see a cute kitty cat sitting in the shop window and I kind of like turn and look at it. Ah, it's a cute kitty cat. Desire right there. I, I, I have a pleasant experience when I see the cat and then me doing this like in double take, I, wanna, I almost want to stop and hit the animals. Desire right there. Okay, so that's on a quite a subtle level. It's not greed. I don't have greed for a cat. I don't even know what that would mean. But desire and aversion to sense your objects is a key thing. And then the third one is ignorance or, or a delusion. And this is this can be far broader. And again, we'll talk about this in a bit more detail in a minute. Um, but one of the big things, of course, is understanding, is well, lack of understanding of these processes, for example, lack of understanding these processes of cause and effect, lack of understanding of knowing that our karmas bring about results, lack of understanding about things like the, the fact that objects are not pleasant or unpleasant, that pleasant and unpleasant is, a, is something that comes from me and my senses come into contact with objects. That's, it, pleasant or unpleasant isn't intrinsic in the option in the object. So these are all the various forms of ignorance. And of course, even more fundamentally, ignorance of such things as impermanence, ignorance of such things as the dissatisfactory nature of conditioned existence, and ignorance as to the fact that things are not intrinsic, what we call non-self or emptiness. Third line, ignorance is like intoxication or confusion. Okay, I've talked a little bit about this already. It's like you just you're not clear what's going on. So intoxication, <laughs> people are drunk or under the influence, and they're not clear what's going on, right? Or they're confused about things. They 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 think if something's happened for such and such a reason, and that's not the real reason why it's happening. Yeah, that, that's like not understanding cause and effect, for example. The version is severe. Okay, so here, here this is talking about a bit more if we're talking about hatred or, or, or anger, for example. It's a very severe kind of a thing. Ignorance is like super pervasive. It like pervades like so many things. And it's kind of hard to get rid of for that reason. Aversion or hatred is, is really deep thing. So if, if you think, for example, like, like in a relationship with someone of a friendship, if you get really angry with a friend, then you might say something or you know, to them or whatever, whatever, um, that can have a really destructive effect on, on that relationship, right? It might like never quite be, be the same again. Um, so it has, you know, some pretty, pretty heavy consequences, even if it's fairly short-lived. And desire, on the other hand, desire is also fairly pervasive as well. And I think it's fairly safe to say that society in general kind of is quite a bit more accepting of desire. And, and I don't mean this is necessarily as a capitalist society, just like societies in general. Um, desire it's, it's fairly acceptable um, but it's also very deep and it's very hard to get rid of now one of the reasons why it's got that problem that aversion doesn't is what happens is when we encounter objects that we have aversion towards our usual response is to get away from them right things we don't like we avoid like, we, like oh that person like oh, I really don't like them so I avoid them and because I avoid them I'm far less likely to then have my aversion or anger towards them triggered. I mean, most of them, I mean, some people aren't, some people just like fixate on things that they don't like. Yeah, so unfortunate. Desire, on the other hand, is because you like that object, you're constantly trying to be near that object. And because then you're constantly trying to be near that object, you're constantly getting stimulated and your desire keeps on getting stimulated more and more. So that's a bit trickier, right? <laughs> um, it's kind of like addiction. Um, you want that object, it creates the problem, um, but you like it, you get some sort of pleasure out of it, shall, shall we say. So these are the three basic afflictions, desire, aversion, and ignorance. And when we're talking about all three of these, we're talking about from a subtle level to a very deep level. Um, the first two, particularly about our sensual objects. And remember, really important, remember how they're connected with the sensations we experience. Pleasant experience, we tend to have desire for that object. Unpleasant experience, painful experience, we tend to have aversion for that object. And ignorance is just this general not understanding of really what's going on 
terms of cause and effect, impermanence, dissatisfaction, and non-self. Okay, that is verse 73. And I think that's probably about enough for today. <laughs> we'll be continuing on in our next class. Um, next class, we're going to be talking a little bit further about um, some of the afflictions, right? Because remember, we're still talking about um, we're still talking about the second noble truth here. So it's really important to understand those afflictions, um, know them for what they are, know what kind of circumstances that they occur so that we can be aware of them when they're happening on a daily basis. And then potentially, if you're up for it, to be able to do something about it, right? That's just sort of day-to-day -day practice, shall we say. It's not necessarily something that you only need to do when you're in meditation. But of course, because mental karma is really the driving force behind the physical and verbal karma, knowing what's going on in our mind is very important. And meditation is that time that we take to just set everything else aside and just be aware of what's going on within. So thank you very much today for joining us and hope to see you back again. I'm going to say next week, but who knows when the next class is going to be for the next class. Okay. So in the meantime, take care.